Okay. <clears throat> Hello, period two. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. All right. Today we are going to finish Foucault. And so uh, I know it's been a hot minute since we've gotten over it, so I'll do a super brief review. We'll go over uh, his final, the final part of his uh, philosophy, and then we'll evaluate him. So here we go. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Da, 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 da. Okay. Can everyone see the PowerPoint? Yeah. Okay. I feel like I always have to ask because I've heard of like like nightmare stories of teachers like going on and on and talking about like a PowerPoint or a presentation, and then like none of the students can see it. So <laughs> I just want to make sure that you guys can see it. Uh, everyone sees it. The new other. Sick, cool. And of course, remember, uh, I would always encourage you to participate. Um, and if, if you prefer to type, that's totally fine too. Um, just, you know, engage as much as you can. All right, today's the 18th. Uh, the homework is just to finish the, essentially finish the, the reading, 28 to 34, and then do the discussion board for today. Uh, salut, Leila. <laughs> All right, so let's begin. So, oh, I see something in the chat already. Um, also, I realized that I totally misspelled societies in this slide. Mabi. <laughs> Uh, bless you guys. Okay, so before we get into this topic, okay, disciplinary societies, let's start with this, are not normal. Um, yes, I know I misspelled societies, my bad. Disciplinary societies are not normal. Oh, what the heck, why am I learning? What the hell? Wait, hold on, of course I'm experiencing technical difficulties. One second, sorry. Okay, is it, okay, we're good now? Yeah. Hello. Are we good? Yes. Okay, good, good, good. All right. Now, uh, what I was going to say was last time we spoke, uh, we were talking about something called the panopticon. So let's start with that. What is a literal panopticon? Let, let, let's start by defining our terms. Well, what's, what's an actual physical panopticon? Well, what is that? <laughs> Layla, your comment. Uh, Declan. It's basically like a prison that um, with like uh, that's like usually circular with this large guard tower in the middle mm -hmm. with like a giant spotlight that's constantly moving like looking at the prisoners and the prisoners also have like glass in between them their cells so they're like mm -hmm. always looking at each other so basically they, at a certain point the spotlight isn't just keeping everyone in check like the prisoners are doing most of that. Excellent. No, that's precisely it. A panopticon is a prison, but it has a circular, a ring design where the cells are in a ring around a central guard tower that has a 360 degree view of the prisoners. So the prisoners are constantly being sur sur surveyed, or at the very least, they feel like they're being watched by either the guards or by the other prisoners. Okay, that's a literal panopticon. But what does Foucault mean when he says that you live in a panopticon? Because, you know, you, obviously you're not literally in one, but what does he mean when he says society is like a panopticon? Well, what is the metaphor? Nobody remembers? What, is, what, is, what, what does Foucault mean when he says you are living in a panopticon? Oh, sorry, I see two people raising hands. Um, Edwin. Um, what, what he basically means is that the government, well, he, the government could be watching you or could not be watching your activity. And so um, like any social media or like internet usage, uh, they automatically track that and then also simultaneously people around you post similar things that make you want to post a similar thing as well. No, precisely. Uh, it's that the government and corporations are watching you. That's like the central guard tower. But other people are always watching you. And the crazy thing is you are voluntarily giving all of this up. Like you are voluntarily giving up this information, especially on social media websites. So it's like you are purposefully giving up this information. And so other people are constantly looking at you and shaping your behavior. Uh, I mean, you think about all the dumb stuff that people post on social media, uh, the selfies, the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, oh, everyone has to go take pictures of the wildflowers up in like, ugh. oh, so annoying. Anyway. Your behavior is largely shaped by the way other people view you, and Foucault could not have predicted the rise of social media as a way of like really shaping the way your behavior is. Now, this is where Foucault gets really like interesting, I think, is the way he applies it to the way society is structured. That's what we're going to get into today. So, uh, okay. 
let's begin today's lecture with this question. What is normal? I love this gif, it's very hypnotic. Who gets to decide what is normal and who isn't? Who, who decides that? Who decides like, oh, it's normal to want to post, you know, pictures of food on Instagram, um, or it's normal to want to like do this or that? Who gets to decide? Fair. I said society. Now, yes, you're absolutely right, society, but, but let's be more specific. Like, like who in a society gets to decide? I guess I would say, like, your, your peers, and I would say, like, I would say, like, celebrities or, mm. like, social, social media, and, like, how we know what something is normal is, like, what we learned previously is, like, about what likes you get and, like, what don't like to get, and I think the amount of likes you get or don't get also helps decide what's normal. Okay, like very that. good. No, no, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, 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 a lot of it is decided by our peers and especially by people with influence. So there is one thing I'd like to add to that. Uh, uh, Frankie, you wanna, what were you going to say? Oh, I was just going to be like, is this where the disciplinary society comes in? Or is that like... Yep, no, no, definitely. It, it, it's, it's basically like, we all decide what's normal by our actions. It, it's, it's kind of a weird paradoxical thing, but it's like, okay. For instance, when you think about fashion, like the things that you like to wear, Fashion is something that's inherently social, unless you're like like a total like avant-garde like weirdo who just like really you know does their own thing. For the most part, we wear things that we think other people will approve of and like. And so, in a way, your own actions contribute to what is normal. Faye, this is a question. So, like, is the idea of like normalcy like is that where how like disabilities? I don't think we're invented, but like it seems like there's. Like my mom told me there's a disciplinary disorder, I forgot what that's called, but there's all these like disorders or there's autism and then there's like a spectrum. Is that like society saying like, oh, you're oh. not normal? Cause like to yeah. me, like, cause to me, like, for example, like I think like anxiety and depression are real, are real things. It's like, I don't think like society created that to say, oh, well you're abnormal or not normal. I think those are like chemically imbalanced things, but like, I'm not quite sure, but I was told that like, my mom told me with um, autism, like there is like, uh, this brain doesn't work a certain way compared to how other people's brains work. So, okay, so let me start by saying, unfortunately with this class, I did not get to be able to teach you about Foucault's history of madness. He actually wrote a whole book on this and I, and I lectured it to the other side. My lectures are available on YouTube if you're really interested in that. But basically Foucault would say that, yes, um, there is such a thing as like neuronormativity, which is like, oh, if you don't have like autism or, or this like neurological disorder, then that means you're normal. But what Foucault wants to point out is, okay, who gets to decide that somebody with autism isn't normal? Because the way that we treat the mad, you know, or, or you know, those with, with, with mental disorders or disabilities has changed considerably in the term of, you know, the course of history. And so who we consider to be normal is based, Foucault says, totally on our needs as a society. Because we live in a capitalist society, someone who suffers from like, let's say schizophrenia is just not useful in that society. Whereas in ancient societies, someone who today we would say has schizophrenia was viewed at as like a, let's say a conduit for the gods or an oracle or some sort of shaman. And they had utility in a, in a, in a, in a society, but not anymore. And so when you say someone like is, on, first of all, even diagnosing someone to be on the spectrum is, is a very vague designation. And Foucault would say it's actually more of a matter of power and control by separating those who are not like us and you end up creating a new other, which is actually today's lecture. Um, so to answer your question, basically, uh, yes. Uh, do people suffer from anxiety? Maybe, like, for, like what I mean by that is like, yes, I'm sure there are chemical reactions, but the way that we view and treat people with anxiety, I think is totally dependent on our culture. Um, I know I've like I know I have anxiety, but I don't really feel like I'm ostracized. Well, 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 time out, time out. You don't have anxiety. We, we went over this with Wittgenstein. It's not a thing. It's 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 okay. a word. It's a linguistic concept. Okay, well, I okay, duh. But I, well, well, I, 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 I have the chemical. Done. I have the chemical chemical imbalance that causes me to overanalyze and overthink and worry about things that sometimes I don't even need to worry about, or I feel like I have this weight on my shoulders. So whatever word we want to choose to call it, 
that's what well, I have. You're forgetting your Wittgenstein because you're assuming that it exists outside of language. What is it outside of? It's okay, correct. Technically, it doesn't exist outside of language, but no, like, no, no, it might, Faye. We just don't know what it is. Okay, yeah, yeah technically, but let's like ignore Wittgenstein for a second. I don't see how you can't fix this. Whatever, but you get what I'm saying, though. I do get what you're saying, but I'm trying to explain to you that is it possible that, let's say, anxiety exists outside of language? Oh, yeah, it's totally possible, especially if it's a, like a physical uh, reaction in the brain. But what I'm trying to get you to realize is that the way that you view and the way that you think about your anxiety and the mere fact that you think anxiety is negative is based on your culture and language. Well, yeah, right? I think the reason, I don't know if there's anything, like, I guess negative, but I think it's, I guess, negative based off, like, our society and, like, what we consider is, like, normal or abnormal or like I think it's negative based off like what how it mm -hmm. causes me to feel or what I feel yeah. or no and, and, and actually that, that's actually a great transition fade to what I'm going to get into now oh okay. which is <laughs> funny enough what happens to the people who are not normal or the people who don't conform I love this kid oh so sad anyway what happens to people who don't conform or who are unable to do so either because of, let's say, a neurological, um, uh, you know, th their brain is literally shaped differently, or, or because their behavior is outside of the norm. What do we do to people who don't conform? What happens to people who do not conform? Declan. Uh, they're kind of, like, cast out, like, of, of, like, of either, like, social groups, like, if you're, like, trying to, like, they may not have, like, as many friends, or they might find it harder to get, like, any type of occupation, like, a job to, like, support themselves, um, and it just makes life, like, in general, just more difficult for them to, like, have. <laughs> no, it does, so, I mean, it leads to ostracization, absolutely, yeah. Uh, Layla? Well, I'm thinking of it as, like, a social media standpoint, like, if you oh. do something that's, like, kind of out there on social media, it's, like, not necessarily, like, an automatic like ostrich. I can't say oh, it the way I wanted to say it, but um, you won't immediately get cast out because it's like there could be a way where people it could start a new trend. Like that's what I'm trying to like bring here. It's like sometimes if you go outside the box, there's always a chance that it could start a new trend. Like it start a new level of conformity. No, I think you're absolutely right, because that's how trends start in the first place. Like, it does take some visionary or some person to, like, do something different and then get people to follow them. No, you're absolutely right, Layla. Though I think the majority of the time, yeah. though, yeah, it doesn't work that way. But you're right, you're right. Sometimes it does start a trend. Um, yeah. Merritt, what, what were you going to say? Just what Layla said, it was going to do a trend, be a trend. Yeah, the way trends are started. Yeah, absolutely. But for the most part, if someone is, like, just weird they're socially ostracized. Now, if someone really goes against a society and doesn't follow society's rules, for example, where do they end up? Like if someone's like really rebellious against society, like they really break the rules, where do we send them? Jail. Very good, jail. And that's what we're gonna talk about. So here's something to keep in mind though, as we get into today's topic. Foucault really wanted to hammer this point. There is no all-powerful oppressor. Let me explain. We all keep each other in line through our panoptical structures. We are actively, though perhaps not consciously, participating in institutions of power. We are all prisoners in a prison with no bars, no locks, and no walls because they are not necessary. Okay, let me give you an example. Let's take a social problem like institutionalized racism, which we would all agree, I hope, is still an issue in this country. Go America. But uh, here's a kind of a diabolical thing that Foucault points out. Hypothetical. If all white people were to just disappear tomorrow, like poof, gone, no more white people, is racism over? All white people, gone, poof, magically disappeared. Is racism gone, over, no longer a problem? No, Merit, no. No, I'd like someone uh, who hasn't participated yet. What do you guys think? So if all white people disappear tomorrow, no more white people, is, 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 is there still gonna be racism? Someone who hasn't participated yet today? No white people, is there still racism? I mean, because by definition, right, there's no more whiteness to, to oppress people of color, right? What do you guys think? Uh, let's see, Edwin, go ahead. 
Uh, there's so uh, racism, even though white people don't exist, because other people also upheld the system. So in participating with the system, you go along with what they say, and you're forcing on others, even though white people aren't like present. So, okay, so part of it is because, unfortunately, besides white people, who else ends up perpetuating these systems of oppression? people of color. I know it sounds really awful, but really stop and think about it. Like, of course, it's not conscious, but many times people of color will act out those roles. So that hierarchy that's created doesn't just disappear with white people. Um, and who knows, maybe a new racial hierarchy is created without white people. Maybe it's Asians now. Who knows? Um, but to say that like with white people, like, oh, white people are the problem. If we got rid of that group, then everything would be fine. It's the same fallacy of thinking like, oh, if we got rid of all rich people, if we like, you know, the 1% are gone, then, oh, uh, you know, class inequality and income inequality will disappear. You think so? Probably not. If all men were to disappear tomorrow, is sexism over? Again, probably not. Uh, when you consider, it's, it's panoptical. So it's like, yeah, the guards, metaphorically, are the ones that keep you in line, but so do the other prisoners. And even if you just, if you overthrow the guards, but don't change the fundamental structure of the prison, then you're just gonna replace the guards with a new set of guards, that's all. And then you don't really solve anything, says Foucault. Does that make sense? Okay, so I wanted to kind of, you know, preview that before we got into the topic. So now let's get into something called the carceral network and the human sciences, or the creation of the new other. I think I mentioned this before, but Foucault was really into prison reform in France. Like, he, like you know, he, he, walked, he walked the walk in, in a lot of ways. He um, was very much, uh, you know, in favor of reforming the prison because he thought prisons were fundamentally broken. And let me explain why. First of all, prisons do not diminish crime rates. We talked about this before at the beginning of Foucault. You probably already know that. Uh, in fact, there's studies that show that prisons increase crime, not decrease it. So for the zillionth time though, why do we have prisons? If, we, if a careful analysis reveals that they don't work, why do we have them? Declan. Uh, yeah, like control and discipline are like the main ones just to keep society, like everyone try at least to keep people in check, and get a, a hold on everything. Very good. Precisely. It's about discipline and control. However, we tend to see that prisons target certain groups of people over others. Overwhelmingly, what kind of people end up going to prison in our country? Overwhelmingly. Oh, come on now. You guys know this. What, 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 what kind of populations of people end up going to prison in this country? Declan? Oh, uh, well, just people of color in general. Yeah, black and brown, mostly. Uh, black and brown people, overwhelmingly, and poor people, including poor whites. Uh, poor people and black and brown people are overwhelmingly overrepresented in our prison system. Why? Foucault says it's not an accident. It's not this, that the system is broken. The system is working as it is intended to work. And those have horrible effects. Essentially, what ends up happening, says Foucault, is a whole new class of person is invented, a, a, a criminal class, a prisoner class, that are like meant to perpetuate these systems. For example, when you think about the effect on the inmate's family or the inmate's community, think about the effect that imprisonment has on the family of the convicted. Like if they have a, a, a son or daughter, or if they have, you know, a, a parents to take care of, siblings, et cetera, et cetera. What are the long-term effects of imprisonment? Well, here's the really awful thing. It creates a whole new class of people, criminals. Because it makes sense. It's like, okay, look, if your dad goes to prison and you are now left without a dad, you now are more at risk of going to prison, just statistically speaking. Um, because of poverty, because of crime, because of the neighborhood that you're raised in, you are now more likely to go to prison as well. Mir? Not only that, but also like if you go to school and everyone knows that your dad went to prison, you're looked down from like, it's really sad that too. It is. And there's like a stigma. Like you are not even the one who did anything wrong, but just by mere, um, you know, the mere fact that you're related to someone who's in prison is like a black stain. Furthermore, even if you go to prison and you serve your time, you know, you serve your sentence out, 
um, you still will always have that black mark on you. It's like a stain that won't wash off you. It'll affect your, your employment. It'll affect where you can live. It's, it's, it's really horrible. And it ends up perpetuating uh, you know, prisoners within a certain population of people. Again, in this country, black and brown and poor people. So why do we still have prisons? It seems obvious that prisons are a failure, so why? Discipline and control, because, and this is where Foucault gets really uh, revolutionary in a sense and very critical, deviant behavior has to be cured. Have you ever thought about how horrible and messed up this is? We assume that if someone is a criminal, that there's something wrong with them, either because of their environment or because of their biology. You know, We're even getting to the idea of like, perhaps some people have a genetic predisposition towards violent behavior, for example. The really insidious thing is that we still insist that our delinquents, our criminals, are suffering from conditions that can be cured, even though society is the one that branded them defective in the first place. It's like, it's really fucked up. It's like, oh, I'm sorry, Leila, you wanna to add to that? Well, like, there are like genes that, like, I don't know, like, I, I've been watching like crime stuff lately. Like, there are like serial killer genes where it's like, oh, like, a certain genetic makeup is more likely to become like a serial killer, like has those impulses. Now, now you're definitely not wrong with that, Layla. And in fact, I think that they've shown their studies, for instance, of like um, in like violent inmate populations. First of all, they're overwhelmingly male, mm -hmm. and, and they and they discover that they, they have like an uh, like an extra Y chromosome. Some of these guys, which could lead like they 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 assume leads to like you know outwardly masculine behavior like aggression and stuff like that. And you may be right, and science may have something to say about that. The problem is when you combine that science with our social structures, is then it creates this unfortunate implication of like, oh, you're genetically predisposed to committing crime. Oh, most people that commit crime are black. You see how yeah. it, you see how it, and, and, and it's not necessarily just the science, it's science paired with a really racist and unequal society. Um, but, so, but you're absolutely right. I mean, it's like, it, oh, there's entire fields of study, like criminology dedicated to figuring out like what causes people to commit crime and perhaps their genetic predispositions to certain behaviors. Um, maybe, yeah. Uh, oh, Faye, you have your hand up. Yeah, I was gonna say like, my grandpa was telling me like how he thinks like there are some genes that make you less empathetic or like don't feel pain or like they don't see like what they do you cause people. Like, like pain, but, like to me like, I like a lot of this like question to me comes up when it comes with the idea of like rape like because the reason why I do that because a lot of people say like alcohol affects like your behavior like chemically affects your behavior but I know that my when my I never see my dad get drunk but I know a lot of people that drink alcohol don't rape women like you know or don't rape somebody so like is it really like, to me is it really like, an chemical balance that is it like is the idea of, like maybe is that rapist always like had the intended to rape that alcohol just like rampants that like um not emotion but that urge that urge to rape someone like cause i know we learned like in core that like, rape's a form of power and control i'm just like curious because i always like wondered like wondered that like i don't really get like how alcohol affects the brain because it could make more people more loud violent it can make people like, I don't know. So I just was curious about that. Now, you raise an excellent question, Faye. I'm not an expert on the effects of alcohol on the brain. As far as I understand it, what alcohol does is it lowers your inhibitions, which basically means um, it affects the way that you would make decisions. Like it, it might, you might end up performing a course of action or behaving in a way that you normally would not. Like normally a voice in the back of your head would say, oh, no, don't do that. And alcohol just, you know, uh, lowers those inhibitions. So, I mean, the classic example is like when two people like hook up when they're drunk, like when they're sober, they might not have ever done that. But then when they're drunk, it's like, ah, well, okay. And in regards to your example of rape, is it possible that like if a man gets drunk and then, you know, rapes someone that he always kind of had that intention? It's hard to say. I don't know. Um, I don't have any scientific data to prove it one way or another. Um, I guess from personal experience, I can tell you that um, when people get drunk, they tend to there tends not to be a fundamental change in personality. Like if someone is kind of like an anxious, depressed person, that kind of comes out more when they're drunk. Or if they're kind of like a happy, jovial person, that tends to come out more when they're drunk. Um, the, the Romans had this very charming expression. The Romans used to say, uh, 
in wine, there is truth. Uh, meaning that like when someone gets drunk, they're kind of like showing a little bit more of like their true uninhibited self. Um, maybe, but I don't know to the effect that alcohol has, I don't know the effect that alcohol has in the brain. Maybe it affects you more than, than we think. I'm not sure. Um, but you raise a good question. But you know, the fact that those studies are even being done is just a way of, yeah, controlling uh, criminality and behavior. And the point that I want to make is this, though. Okay, society needs you to be a certain way. In our capitalist economic mode, you need to be a certain kind of person. And if you don't fit that mold, then we need to fix you and turn you into that mold. And if you are refused or are unable to be molded in that way, then you're just kind of cast aside and you're put in an institution or a prison or something of that nature. So why have delinquents? All right, this is the, this is the real crux of the matter. In order to have winners in a capitalist society, that means if we live in a society that is competitive, that is a non-zero sum game, uh, in order to have winners, what do we need? Losers. We need losers. And this sounds really messed up, but really think about it. This is Foucault's crux. This is, this is kind of like the basis of his philosophy, is this. You cannot reform capitalism. You cannot reform capitalism. You will never solve the problems of racism, sexism, homophobia, able. You will never solve any of those problems as long as capitalism is around because it is inherently an unequal system. And in order to have winners, we can have losers. Now, you can shift things around and maybe some groups become winners and some groups become losers, but there will always be a winning group and a losing group. And if you have a winning group, they will do everything in their power to make sure that they stay winners. So if you have like white people that were winners in many ways, you know, they conquered a lot of places in the world, um, they want to stay winners. And so they will create institutions that benefit them. Though I do want to make this clear. It wasn't like purpose. Like it, it wasn't like a group of white people purposefully came together and like, let's, oh, let's plan out a racist institution. Uh, you, like, they don't give them too much credit. Like it just kind of like happened uh, artificially. Like it just kind of like happened as a result of society forming in this way. It wasn't like somebody like grand engineered this. It, it just turned out this way, historically speaking. Um, and Foucault says, if you really truly want to solve problems of inequality and oppression, you can't have capitalism. <laughs> you see how radical he is in that sense? Uh, and maybe he's right. So people who are for reform of capitalism tend to disagree with Foucault. They say, no, 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 you can reform capitalism. Capitalism can work. We can, we can fix it. We can make it work for more people. But Foucault's claim is, nope, it is fundamentally broken. And if you really want to fix these problems, you got you to you get rid of it. Uh, <laughs> what do you think? Well, we're going to get more into this, but uh, do, do you guys think that's, that's too cynical or, or do you think he's got a point? Declan? I mean, I'd say he's got a point. I mean, there's a lot of evidence that points to his point being true, considering like how many problems capitalism has. I just think like a lot of times, you know, to me, what's interesting is when you say capitalism has a lot of issues, but it's like, I mean, I don't know another system that Mm -hmm. we could put in you know in place capitalism that would be great i feel like we've got so used to it it's like we're so dependent on it yeah. i don't know where we would go without it yeah oh and i see uh, Faye, you, you type that in that that's exactly the crux of the problem though what do we replace it with if we, we all agree yeah capitalism is flawed but then what do we replace it with communism we've seen how that worked out <laughs> uh and so you know, you're right. And, and, and Declan, you bring up a good point. It's hard for us to even envision a society without capitalism. But what are we better off? I mean, look, we were talking before this lecture about like all the problems with like, you know, with work right now during the pandemic uh, and how capitalism is just so incompatible by uh, meeting the needs of people before the economy. Um, Maybe, but it's so hard for us to imagine a system, an economic system outside of capitalism, because yeah, like you said, we've been born and raised in it. And it's so difficult. In fact, I, I remember I, I recently read this, um, this article where this, uh, this, this postmodern critic basically said, uh, it is easier for us to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine an end to capitalism. And I think he's right. Like we make movies all the time about the end of the world, like, you know, an asteroid destroying Earth, a pandemic killing everyone. But we can't, we find it so difficult to imagine a world without capitalism. Personally, Faye, go ahead. 
Okay. Personally, I think it's like impossible, not impossible because like, for example, if you think of socialism, the government provides everything for you. Like it would say like you'd say the government provides everything. And so I guess to me, you would say there wouldn't be grocery stores. There would be like one like a food because grocery stores are still part of capital, capitalism because mm-hmm. there's different brands. And then like same with clothing, but like personally, I wouldn't want the government to make one brand of clothing and have all of us like wear that. Like I would want to choose where I get to buy my clothing. Right, right. But, but, but in fact, you're right. And you're being honest. And I think many of us feel that way. But I think what Foucault is trying to get you to see is you only feel that way because you were born and raised in a capitalist society. I guess so. But like, I feel like I have ideas of like socialism, but like, like, like you said, like, I like certain, like, I like certain things like like even though like we have like a norm of how to like dress and there's like what's because they're cool and not cool like we all go to different stores to get that like I know people go to different stores than I do like like what some person may go to PacSun I may go to American Eagle or you may go to both but like I don't know I just saying like I think I think even people that are poor like the idea to choose where they get to go shopping like or some right. care, some don't. Yeah, Faye, but again, what I'm trying to get you to realize is that fundamentally, if we have capitalism, we're going to have inequality because not everyone has access to go to American Eagle or you know choose their brand. In fact, most people don't. That makes sense. And so, so I agree with you know, that. In an ideal world, everyone would be able to like choose their favorite brand, right? Like, oh, I like wearing you know Banana Republic. I like wearing you know this, whatever. But that's just not the way it works. Um, most people don't choose <laughs> like you know in that way because they don't have the money um again i guess what we're really debating here is is capitalism reformable or does it have to be overthrown and foucault is definitely in the in the camp that it has to be overthrown if you want to solve these problems if you don't care about these problems then he says whatever then continue to perpetuate the system but if you do care about social justice and social issues you have to think of an end to capitalism <laughs> which is a tall order i agree and and, and who knows there are people who disagree with him. And of course, like I mentioned before, here's a kicker. There is no giant Illuminati type conspiracy. It's not like there's like this group of people that are like conspiring to keep everyone else down. It just kind of artificially turned out this way. Like it's, it's an accident. It's an accident of history. Um, it just kind of turned out this way. So that's why people who believe in conspiracy theories to me are kind of laughable. Uh, you know, have you guys heard of any like, because they're all coming out of the woodwork now. Have you guys heard of any weird like uh, uh, conspiracy theories recently? Because I heard of a few, but I want to ask you guys first. So what are some conspiracy theories y'all have heard of? See, Faye? Sorry, like I'm at work and I'll hear these cons- conspiracy theories like all the time for some of my employees. Like one of them are saying, oh, the government knew about this like all along and they could have avoided it or like the government is overreacting about the six feet thing. Like they just made up a number and like <laughs> overreacting about like all these like precautions. Yeah. Yeah. Like you should take um, that like, I heard a superior C3, this is probably a common one that like, the reason how China ended their, uh, ended the pandemic is that they put, or I don't know if you shared this or forgot how I heard this, but they put everyone in a room and they killed everybody that like had the disease. And that's how they ended the coronavirus. Like, I don't know if that's necessarily, like, true or, like, or just, like, China is keeping secrets from us or something. Like, I've just heard stuff like that. Like, my word, oh, my God. Like, these older people, like, these, some people that are in their, like, 20s or some people even, like, 30s or 40s or 50s, like, have these, like, weird conspiracy theories. Like, it's, (laughs) sorry, I find it fascinating. Like, like, I just sit there and I nod. There, there, there's a lot floating out there. Uh, Josh, what have you heard? Um, this has to be the craziest one I've heard. Um, but apparently, like, in, like, a couple years back, Bill Gates was, like, talking about, like, um, you've heard this one? Yeah. Yeah. Bill Gates basically said, like, um, he's like, oh, uh, imagine if there's a pandemic and we don't have the technology to do so. And so I feel as if we must expand and whatnot to – make sure that we can treat people accordingly and then boom two years later like pandemic hits and now people are like thinking bill gates did it and now he's trying to come up with like some type of technology that like figures out the temperature of people through like 5g towers and like and through thermal imaging and it's it's all just a mess 
Yeah, I've heard of that. Like Bill Gates caused uh, Corona, and uh, and that five G causes Corona. Uh, Jesus Christ, Edwin. I was also going to say a five G tolerance. Yeah, that's another one. In my opinion, conspiracy theorists tend to be people who cannot accept the idea that shit happens for no reason sometimes. And that, uh, like, a a really common one is like, oh, that the corona was uh, bioengineered in a lab in Wuhan. Um, Even though uh, most, like, we're talking like 99% of, like, biomedical researchers have gone on record saying, no, the coronavirus does not seem to have been designed in the lab. It doesn't have the, the telltale signs of being uh, design the lab. Um, most likely it just happened. Like these pandemics do happen naturally. And we just have a very hard time accepting that it seems. We, we want there to be some like order or some, some, some thing that we can blame and attack. Declan? I don't know. Like, I don't know. What do you, th- what do you think about like flat earthers, bro? Like those are some real interesting people. <laughs> they certainly are. Uh, and I think for that same reason, like I think it creates meaning in their lives because they can't, Except that we're just like in a you know a tiny little speck of dust floating around in a galaxy. That's what I think. I think uh, people need a good healthy dose of existentialism. <laughs> Not unlike religion, Faye. I agree. Oh, like people that are into, really into astrology. That's that's my pet peeve. <laughs> that is the worst. Mm-hmm. I remember Basinger, Basinger in like tenth grade. We were like in his class, and he was like, "You realize like a lot of most astrological signs are like bullshit, considering that like the stars don't actually like even align with that like I, those ideas anymore. So you might not even be the astrological sign that like you think you are." And everyone was like, "What? Well, how could you say that?" Like I was like, "Oh, d- damn! I didn't realize people took this that seriously." Yeah, people are nuts. Uh, anyway, so my point is this though: I don't think there's a big conspiracy, according to Foucault, that creates these institutions. It just kind of ends up that way. In a word, it's all one big giant accident. Good news though, if it's an accident, then that implies that it doesn't have to be that way and that they can change, that that's kind of Foucault's silver lining. Okay, you don't have to answer these questions, but just kind of a little bit of personal reflection. How about you? Think about your life. Is it fair that you live the way you do while others suffer in your community and the world? I mean, look, if you're bored right now during this pandemic, uh, congratulations, uh, first world problems. Like there are people who are, worried about getting sick and dying. There are people who are worried about their next paycheck, paying rent, paying mortgage, um, you know, buying food. And so we live in a very unequal society. And by the way, this pandemic, what it's really doing is just laying bare the inequality in this society. And so is that fair? Uh, and that's just something for you to consider. I, you know, you know, in fact, I prefer you not answer this out loud, just something to reflect. Is it fair that you live the way you do? And if you don't think it is, is it your responsibility to do something about it? Oh, well, Layla, go ahead. You don't have, uh, oh, okay. I am doing the question, don't worry. <laughs> but I, uh, I read something like kind of interesting that because everyone's saying like, oh, like, we're all in the same boat here. But someone was like, we're not all in the same boat. Like we're in the same storm, mm. but like different boats. No, you're right. I mean, I think that's a good metaphor. We are all in the same storm. But yeah, you're right. Like some of us are like in like these luxurious yachts and some of us are in these yeah. really dingy little <laughs> canoes. Mm-hmm. I, I agree. I agree. Okay, we have about 30 minutes left. So let's go ahead and now evaluate Foucault, though. So a conclusion, what to think about Foucault and whether or not we should accept his uh, ideas. Remember, just because I teach you someone does not mean that I agree with them. I just want you to grapple with their ideas. So let's evaluate them. Okay, so far, we can all agree. Okay, Foucault's a pretty negative guy. But do you think he's right? about his, Do you think his analysis of society is on point? What do you guys think? Someone hasn't spoken today, ideally? What, what do you think of Foucault so far? Do you agree with him, disagree, mostly agree, mostly disagree? What do you guys think so far? So ideally, someone hasn't spoken today. Oh, hold on, I see someone is in the... <laughs> uh, yes, I would invite everyone to uh, speak. So I'll, 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 I'll re- uh, re- let me reframe the question. Um, so far, do you agree with Foucault or do you think he's like a little too negative? Like, do you think he's spot on in his analysis of society or do you think like eh, a little too negative? What do you guys think? Let's just chat. <laughs> Hmm. 
Come on, one person has participated. Yes, I agree. Everyone has wonderful things to say. Should, do you want me to reframe the question uh, or, or is it just a hard question to answer? Karina, type something in the chat if you want to see. Oh, she just did? Yeah. Oh, all good, Karina. Okay, Josh, that's fair. It is a lot taken. Um, I, I guess if, if I were to, to kind of give you some common responses that I hear is most of students tend to say, I mostly agree with Foucault, but I do think he's a little negative. <laughs> that's the most common response that I hear. Um, okay, Declan, go ahead. I mean, yeah, I feel like he points out a lot of, he has a lot of good, a lot of great points. And I feel like, especially now, like they've just gotten like, with social media, they've just gotten more and more relevant over time. Like with technology, it's, I think he was pretty ahead of like, you know, his time in terms of where he saw like uh, America going and especially just like our society. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I think, I think I agree with him a lot, but now it's kind of like you have to rest with the idea like, hey, like okay, well then now to, where do we go from here? You know what I mean? Like, yes, capitalism has a lot of flaws and yes, we are living this panopticon, but it's like, what can we, act I find it hard because like, what can I actually like do about it, you know? No, that's exactly right. And that's what we're going to get into because he has a solution, but it's kind of a weird one. But you're right. Like, okay, Foucault, maybe you're right. But what are the solutions? You're, that, and that's a fair question to ask. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Josh. Um, yeah, um, honestly, like, I'm kind of drawing a blank in what we've learned as a whole, like for the majority of the time that we've been together. But I, what, from what I remember, I think he's very realistic and he has a point in making most of his negative comments because like, I mean, I think the common thread in what we've learned in your class is that life overall is more negative with some silver linings of positive. And he's yeah. just kind of like, like you say, laying bare the negativity. So I think, I think that he's very dramatic in expressing it and very real in expressing it. But again, like, like Dr. said, there's no real solution that he's offering. He just kind of points it out. Yeah, okay. And again, totally a fair assessment as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Faye? Um, like I was going to say, I feel like Foucault makes us see things that we don't want to see. Oh, so like we yeah. <laughs> don't want to see that we're controlled by social media and we're controlled in society. And I think he makes us ask, he makes us ask us like the difficult questions and he makes us like confront like the difficult, like, yeah, questions. And I think my question earlier was, I just want to know what his, like, solution is. Because, like, to me, like, I know, like, we learned about philosophers, and then they didn't provide a solution. And to me, that's, like, frustrating. It's, like, you could complain all you want, but, like, uh, yeah. you have to provide a solution. That's what I think with people that don't vote. I'm, like, really, <laughs> what's the point of you complaining if you didn't, like, yeah, we're gonna, if you're not going to do anything about it? Yeah. Uh, he does have a solution, which we're about to get into now, though it is kind of controversial because some people say that like it's kind of like it doesn't work, but let's evaluate it. Okay, so as a quick refresher of everything we kind of just went over, like this week and, and last week and the week before, the way that you view a great many things, including things like justice, criminality, nor normalcy, are limited by what the panopticon deems to be acceptable. Thus, we live in what Foucault calls a disciplinary society. One, your bodies are made docile, don't question or rebel. Two, you're trained to behave correctly, like a machine. Three, this training is constantly reinforced by those in authority, experts, and everyone else, the panopticon. It's pretty depressing. Is there any solution? And Foucault would say, yes. In his words, something that he calls micro-political action. Let's see what this compiles of. What does that mean? Basically, there are three steps for Foucault in order to truly reform a society, in order to truly like kind of fix these problems. One, two, three. One, become aware of the power relationships in your series. I mean, th that makes sense. You can't solve the problem if you're not first aware of the power relationships. Though there is an extra step with that that we'll get into. Two, develop something that he calls a strategy, not just resistance, to change institutions. And finally, exercise your own individuality and free will in those institutions. That third point's really prickly, especially today in the uh, time of the quarantine and people um, exercising their own individuality in a way that maybe it's not helpful for the rest of us. So again, take everything here with a grain of salt. Let's be critical. Let's get into these really quickly. 
Number one, awareness of power. First things first, you need to be aware that the world is in a terrible state. I think this is easier for us to do now than it was a generation or two ago. <laughs> like this step's pretty easy. Uh, you know, things are broken. And uh, it's funny, Mr. Lin would tell me that when he taught Foucault back in like the 80s and the 90s, it wasn't as pessimistic as it was today. Like kids had a, had a tougher time accepting like, yeah, is the world really that bad? And I feel like you guys are like way more easily able to say, yeah, shit sucks. Uh, and it's broken. So step one. But Foucault says, you got to think more philosophically. Instead of asking questions like, is capital punishment good or bad? Just an example. He says a question like that is simplistic and inadequate. Instead, you should ask questions in a deeper, more meaningful way. What are the legitimate uses of power in the pursuit of justice? What effect does, popu uh, does popular discourse about crime have on so-called powerless individuals? And what power do I have to put into action? Note that all these questions are much more difficult, far more philosophical, but he says more meaningful. So rather than saying like, how do we get Trump out of office? For Foucault, that's not a good question to pursue because for like, you know, just using an example of uh, Trump, Trump is a symptom of a problem. Even if you got rid of Trump, like, okay, Trump dies tomorrow because of coronavirus. Woo! Um, our problem solved? The <laughs> ding dong, the wicked witch is dead? No. No. And, and to focus too much on like one person or one class or one uh, institution, Foucault says is totally ignoring the problem. You need to be aware that everything is a network of problems, which leads into step two, develop strategy. Side note, this is my favorite picture of Foucault. It's the turtleneck with the leather jacket. It's, it's, it's the look. Anyway, for Foucault, a political strategy is a decentering movement, a reordering of the discourses surrounding an object of inquiry, such as madness or criminality or education. What the hell does that mean? Basically, you need to realize that power knowledge relationships are networks of relationships. They're not necessarily top down. So if like people of color get rid of white people, it doesn't solve anything because you have to realize that power is a network. And furthermore, you cannot solve racism without solving classism, sexism, homophobia. Like you can't solve any of those problems without addressing the fundamental root causes. In this case, an inequality stemming from capitalism. You're never gonna get rid of racism if you don't address that first, he says. And maybe he's right. So he says, you need to be aware of what you're doing. You need to have a strategy, okay? I completely agree. Like when you said, like, if you get rid of races, like you have to get rid of all these things. And here's a proof of that. Like, it's really interesting. Like I'm watching the show, Mrs. America. And it's really interesting how exclusive and how like the women's movement, how some people wanted to like liberate, you know, the ERA, like people wanted to like, you know, get women the right to like, equal pay and stuff, but then they wanted to exclude people who are part of the LGBT community, like the lesbian movement, because yeah. they thought they couldn't get things done. But like, to me, like, it's just, it frustrates me so much. Cause like, yeah, you may be liberating one group, but you're still like, there's still the issue of the other. Yeah. Like, the other, and, that, and that's a good word to use. <laughs> oh God, that's not it. Okay. Of a, of a different group, I guess. And I just don't think that's like, right. Cause like, I don't think it's like, I don't think it's fair. Like, yeah, you're helping some people, but the but like when you help the sub people, you're normally helping the more privileged group. Mm -hmm. And like, which was seen in 1920. So when the when women got the right to vote, it was majority white women. I'm not. I want to learn more of like if certain states allowed women of color to vote, depending if they were more liberal or conservative. But like, yeah, like it was white women. Yeah. And so like yeah. to me, like yeah, like that then no. you see the racism and like that and like a lot of our peers here like didn't get to vote got to vote later than i did get it and like i don't think that's yep you, you know and, and that's actually a good example Faye, in this country so okay uh women getting the right to vote women's suffrage we would all agree okay that was a great thing however foucault would point out it didn't actually solve many of the problems it sought out to solve because it turns out that yeah first of all only white women by far and large, were given the right to vote. And so what ended up happening is people thought like, oh, women are gonna like wanna vote for all these radical progressive policies. Overwhelmingly, no. Women ended up voting much the same as their husbands. <laughs> and so places that were already pretty progressive and liberal continue to stay that way, and places that were more conservative stayed conservative. Um, and, and so we saw if you don't address all the problems or the root cause of all those problems, 
Solving one or two doesn't change anything, says Foucault. You have to be aware of that, he says. And furthermore, he says, revolution, he says, is very tricky. Why? Foucault says this, if you have a revolution that aims to overthrow one person or one group of people, it's going to fail. Because here's the metaphor. If you overthrow the guards in the panopticon, it wouldn't matter. They're only part of the panopticon. The system is designed so that the loss of guards just means that they're going to be replaced by new guards. That's all. And the panopticon stays the same. So let me give you a historical example. Anyone recognize these folks? Maybe from A Push or AP Euro? Anyone recognize these folks? Oh, nobody, nobody uh, recognizes them? Oh, come on now. Oh, Lil, I saw a big no? Yes? I'll give you a hint. They're Russian. Really? Oh, come on now. <laughs> Well, if you guys don't remember, or did someone type something in the chat? Uh, yes, right before World War One. Very good. Uh, World family. Yes. Okay. This is uh, these are the Romanovs. Uh, this is the last czar of Russia, Nicholas II. And so this is uh, before, yeah, the, the outbreak of World War One. And of course, famously, what happened to the Romanovs? Because the World War I went so poorly for the Russians. Yep, they were, that's right, Karina, they were, they were killed, they were executed. And so now I, I don't wanna like paint them as like, oh no, the poor Romanovs. Like they, they, were, they were an autocracy. Like they had a secret police force, they murdered lots of innocent people. They were a very oppressive government. So then, and I, I'm simplifying the history here because they were overthrown by a group of, um, you know, uh, uh, Republicans who set up like a temporary dictatorship, tried to establish a democracy, and then they were overthrown by the Bolsheviks, uh, the communists. And so I'm skipping a few steps here, but essentially, eventually the Romanovs were replaced by the Soviet Union. Your daily dose of communism. <laughs> now, okay, the communists came into power with all these idealistic ideas of like, oh, we're gonna create a communist utopia. We're gonna fix all the problems of inequality that the Romanovs have et cetera, et cetera. What ended up happening instead? Especially if you know your history with the Soviet Union, Joseph Stalin, what happened instead? They set out to create a communist utopia and instead... Well, yeah, miserably. Yeah, and a big part Foucault says in his analysis of them, he says the big reason why they failed miserably is because they did not fundamentally change the institutions that they inherited from the Romanovs, from the Tsar. They kept the secret police. They kept so many institutions of power to oppress the people. Essentially, imagine if like the, the, the Tsar was like the, 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 the royals were like the, the, the central guard tower. They were overthrown and simply replaced by the party. <laughs> That's all. And so because you didn't have this fundamental restructuring of society, the revolution failed. Now, I don't want to be a wet blanket. But statements like, smash the patriarchy, the Republicans are ruining the country, the 1% are the enemy, resist Trump, they totally and completely miss the point, according to Foucault. There is no centralized power structure for you to overthrow because power relationships are panoptical. In other words, just getting rid of one institution or one class or one person doesn't change anything on its own. You have to think of it in like a grand scale, like a grand strategy uh, to, to your resistance. So, according to Foucault, resistance without strategy is not radical enough. In fact, if this is where it gets really controversial, resistance may even be necessary to maintaining existing power relations. In other words, it may even be necessary to want to institute um, sort of like, uh, like to, it's necessary for an institution to allow its members to like let off some steam, but not really change anything fundamentally. For example, if you think about protests, um, okay, <laughs> not to call out on any, any one individual person, but do you guys remember the, the climate change protests we had this year? And I think it was like two years ago, the gun control protests we had at Cleveland. Do you guys remember those? Yes. Okay. Now, if you recall, I don't want to like take away or detract the hard work that people put into that, like, you know, students and teachers. However, if we're applying a Foucaultian lens to that, okay, think about it. You had to ask for permission 
from the administration. You were given a designated area to go out and protest. Um, there were numerous administrations, uh, presence out there. There were police out there. Uh, you were not allowed to leave that area and you could only go there during the designated time, like your know, nutrition or lunch. And as soon as the bell rings, you're expected to go back into class. Is that a real protest? No. No, says Foucault. Frankie? Yeah, like, definitely not. Like, the whole idea of protest is to go against what's already established. But in doing that, you're just reinforcing the power that people have over you, and it, yep. it's just controlled, and it just appears to be, like, nice, you know? Yeah, exactly. It makes them seem benevolent and, and nice when in reality, like you're not really causing any change. Uh, Josh? Hello? Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, that's literally what I said when both of the protests went on. I'm like, you're not even protesting. Like, no change is doing anything. If anything, you're gaining like somewhat relative like popularity by doing it because you seem kind of cool in doing it. <laughs> and then everyone like went off on me. They're like, oh my God, Josh, you don't believe in change. I was like, no, it's just not making anything happen. Now, now Josh, you know, the, the counter argument will be like, well, you know, but they raise awareness and raising awareness is good. And, you know, somebody can make that argument. But Foucault would disagree and say, no, because simply raising awareness doesn't do anything. And in fact, if you raise awareness, but don't offer any meaningful action or solution, you actually cause people to not want to do anything. Um, yeah, I mean, um, if I may add one more thing, like you're essentially playing their game and they're letting you like gain somewhat power. Like, yeah. Or the, at least it the seems thought like of that is happening. That's right. And then, the, okay, like for instance, Foucault would say like, let's say like a, a real protest, like the civil rights movement in, this, in the United States. That was dangerous because people were actually breaking the rules. Like they didn't ask for permissions to have sit-ins and people were getting arrested, people were getting beaten, people were getting killed. Um, and that's a real protest. And so Foucault would say, yeah, by like allowing people to like march around and, and sing songs and, and use slogans, he says, is not only ineffective, it's actually harmful. Why? Because when you create things like human rights, like inalienable human rights, you're not as likely to think seriously about radical solutions to changing power relationships. In other words, resistance may help actually support the institutions it attacks by either one of two things. It either makes the institutions appear less brutal than they really are, or it makes serious resistance to them seem impossible. And so if you just resist without a strategy, it's, it's a waste of time. And in fact, you might end up making you know, it worse. Like uh, for instance, if you had like a riot where like you really go out and like destroy property, Foucault would say that's totally counterproductive because yeah, you're getting people's attention, but there's no overall strategy and it's gonna make you look really bad. Um, and then same thing where if you have like this like nice little organized protest, that's kind of defeats the whole purpose of having a protest. Um, back to Josh and then Faye. So, so if we're following that logic, would, would using like a Foucault-esque lens, would you say that, that um, in Do the Right Thing, Mookie didn't do the right thing by essentially doing what you just said? I think I, if I were to apply Foucault to do the right thing, yeah, because he doesn't he doesn't fundamentally solve any of the problems. <laughs> like he just kind of throws the trash can into the window. Yeah, he doesn't he doesn't solve any of the problems fundamentally. He saves their lives, which which might be something, but he doesn't solve any social issue. But I don't think okay. he's trying to solve a social issue. Yeah, Faye. Um, what I was going to say was when I thought of like the gun control protest and mm -hmm. the environmental thing, I didn't really see it as a protest. I saw it more as a rally. Like, I just kind of saw, like, okay, you're making your voices heard. Like, I honestly, like, I did not think that was going to change. Like, I just, like, right. I don't. Like, I think, like, we need to vote. Or, like, you have to, like, get petitions. And you have to get people sign things and for things to really, like, change. Because, like, I honestly don't feel like anything has changed for much for women's rights for the women's marches. Like, I feel like, for me, I kind of saw, I don't say active resistance, but more of active, like, the rebellion but just kind of for people to make your voices heard like I guess for me like going to those to say like oh I'm like I feel like I'm part of like a movement but I don't really think I'm making actual change because like yep. since this like 
you know, how many cases been for Roe versus Wade, like try to overturn the courts. Like there's been so many since, since this, like to me, like if people want, like want real change, you better get out and vote, like vote your damn well, hearts out and like, and, and, and maybe you're right, Faye, but actually Foucault would disagree with that because he says if you, really? vote, you if you vote, you're you're buying into the system. Okay, I agree with that, but like I don't mind the system of voting. Like I feel like I feel like there's flaws into that, but the reason why there's flaws into the voting system is because of the institution of problems of racism, sexism, and homophobia. So if we dismantle those things, then voting won't be as like flawed because I know for me it's I it's easier for me to vote than some other people because like right. there's no like um there's no like id cards or there's not like vote, vote there's no there's never been less i'm unaware like i don't know there's any voter suppression against white people like i never heard of such a thing it's always people of color right well i mean there's a lot of things to keep in mind uh with that but but, but i guess the point i'm trying to make and again i'm presenting foucault's point of view and he is pretty negative but like something like okay yeah, yeah, all the women's marches for like women's rights to happen a couple of years ago like, if you really, it, of course, you could say, oh, yeah, they're great things, they're wonderful things, they raise a lot of awareness, but then if you really get down to brass tacks, what did they accomplish? Like, Brett Kavanaugh was, was, was elected, was nominated to the Supreme Court. Um, Trump is still in office. And now the main Democratic candidate is, like, you know, being accused of, of, of sexually assaulting someone. <laughs> like, what actually ended up happening? Like, like, what positive social change actually came about, if any? maybe it did and maybe we just maybe it's just really subtle but it, it doesn't seem to be like like Foucault would say it was just like all that energy and frustration and legitimate complaints like like legitimate problems that women face are just kind of swept under the rug because oh we had a protest and now everything's fine and it tricks you into thinking that everything's fine that's what that's Foucault's point of view and again it's very cynical it's very negative maybe he's right so this, of course, will lead to like, okay, fine then, Foucault, what do you want us to do? Like, how do we solve these problems? Okay, here it comes. Exercise free will. First of all, he's, Foucault says, well, let's be real. Realize that you are unlikely to change the entire fabric of society, much less the world. Just be real. However, he says, you can change things, at least for yourself and for the people around you, like in your immediate life, your friends, your family, the people you work with, the people you interact with on a daily basis. Foucault claims that you as an individual can make your own decisions within a system of control. It's like, uh, it's like Sartre, uh, you still have free will. In other words, like you can, if you want, create, you know, still make decisions. Even though you're in a prison, panopticon, even though you're in the prison, you still have free will. And you still have the option to act out in ways that you think are right and good. He says that's still a case. Do you guys remember the cute little story that the 11th grade uh, teachers tell you about the starfish? Do they still do that, the starfish story? Yes. Yeah. It's this idea of like, okay, remember, do you guys remember the story about the little girl throwing the starfish back into the ocean? Does that sound familiar? A little bit? It was just this idea that like, if you see a bunch of like beach starfish, they're going to die, you know, because they're out in the sun. If you see one little girl is like slowly one by one, throwing them back into the ocean. And then some guy comes along and says, little girl, you're never going to finish this. Like, you know, so many of them are going to die anyway. Like this is a really fruitless task. The little girl says, well, I have to try. At least I can save some. The guy's inspired. He starts helping her. And then other people come. And then soon, you know, a movement starts because of individual choice. That's kind of the idea behind Foucault, too. He says that unless you have a lot of power and influence, which most of us don't, the best that you can do is just make good individual decisions and actions. And so maybe you can't overthrow these horrible systems of oppression in your lifetime. Maybe, maybe you can't, but at the very least you're free within your own, um, um, like within your own paradigm, within your own free will to do things. In other words, you are free to exert micro political action, micro political power. Maybe it goes right. And he wants you to realize that you are not powerless. Don't see yourself as a helpless victim of power or as a perpetual other or as an object. Power is contingent and vulnerable, which means he's a historian, remember, and a philosopher. He says that power has really shifted up and down throughout the course of human history. And just because things are like this now does not mean that they will always be like this. And in fact, high chance that they won't. So just keep that in mind. Things are the way they are now by accident. And so therefore they can be changed. Um, how, he doesn't really go too much into that detail, but that's, that's kind of what he's trying to get at. Edwin? Uh, having a little sense of freedom, like even within the kind of um, like society, 
wouldn't that mean you're still conforming to society? Yep. Uh, but what's, but what, you're right, yeah, but what are the other, uh, what's the alternative? That you can do something about it um, minimally. Yes, but now here's where Foucault comes under like extra, um, you know, criticism. We're almost done, by the way. According to Foucault, large-scale revolution and social transformation that assume the existence of a central source of power will fail to radically alter the power relationships for institutions because we're still going to be in a panopticon. But what can you as an individual do? Okay, here's where he gets really kind of controversial, especially when you think this in light of the pandemic today. There are loads of rules in our society. Once you become aware of them, you can choose to not follow them, the ones that you don't think are right. Shocking, I know, but seriously, you can judge rules and actively choose to not obey them or ignore them as best you can just do your best not to get caught. Now, you can see the criticism here where Foucault might be putting way too much emphasis on personal liberty because we see how people act with personal liberty. I mean, Frankie tells us that all the time. Uh, <laughs> when, you know, when, when people are, don't act responsibly for other people because you assume that people will make responsible good choices and sometimes they don't. So this is where Foucault gets a little iffy as well for me, um, but I just want to bring that up. Okay, so this is the last slide uh, for today. So last question, and then we'll uh, we'll break. Um, so what do you think? Do you think Foucault is right? Is micropolitical action the only way to change the relations of power in institutions? Do you think he's right? Do you think he's too cynical? Do you think like nah, this is bullshit? What, what do you guys think? And I know this is like a super crash course on Foucault. Usually I'd spend much more time on him, but. What do you guys think so far? Do you agree? Mostly agree? Disagree? Mostly disagree? What do you guys think? Last question for today. Last question for today. Josh. Um, I think that's like the answer I kind of expected or like the ideal answer that was not, not necessarily desired, but you kind of like predicted. Like, to me, it sounds like, it seems like he's trying to advocate. I know that's not how it comes off, but it, it seems like he's trying to say like, oh, change happens within you. And then it happens to other, like a trickle down effect. But like, I don't know, I just don't, like I get it and it's very, it makes sense, but I just don't, I think that's a very long-term process. It takes a lot of time and a lot of effort. And I don't know, I'm just not really buying it. That's fair, and, and again, because uh, it doesn't seem like it immediately solves many of the issues that he's trying to solve. That's fair. Um, Edwin, what do you think? I agree with Josh in that, like, it doesn't create that much of an impact. Um, I mean, having individual freedom is good, but I don't feel like it's the solution. I mean, I don't know if it's the right solution either, but, like... <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, when you consider the way people sometimes act. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I agree. Okay, folks, I'm so sorry. I don't want to keep you because I know we're totally out of time, but uh, I really regret not um, you know, being able to teach you a little bit more about Foucault. But tell you what, I'm going to stick around if you'd like to talk a little bit longer, um, but I, I don't want to you know, keep you. I know it's lunchtime. Um, so thank you guys very much for coming. Uh, and you know, just do your best, uh, Terrence Foucault. I mean, I'm doing my best teaching you, but it's, it's been tough. Uh, so listen. I really invite you and encourage you to come next Wednesday because that'll be Freud and that's all, again, a whole nother thing. And I won't be recording those, so <laughs> just FYI. Um, so yeah, so just uh, let me know and uh, we'll be in touch. So thank you guys so much for coming. I really appreciate it. I'll see you guys on Wednesday and then next week and then that's it. We'll stay in touch. If you'd like to stick around, I'll be here. Otherwise, bye. Oh, Mr. Friend is... Uh